session. So good morning and welcome once again. Um, I'm delighted to have you all here for Social Justice Remade, the Decline of the European Welfare State in a Global Context, 1973 to 2009. This is, of course, a very unusual time and a difficult one for many of us. And so I am especially grateful to all of you for being here, for making the time for um, somehow finding a way to juggle all of your child care, elder care, and other obligations in order to be present for this five day conference. I think I might make a technical announcement first, um, which is um, if you are not speaking, please um, mute your microphone. You can find the microphone icon along the lower bar of your screen on the left hand side. Um, that will help us avoid feedback uh, issues and will make it easier to hear the speakers. So if you could go ahead and mute your mic, that would be terrific. Um, <clears throat> I think just for this introduction, it's just fine for you all to keep your videos on as well, but if you'd like to turn off your videos, that's fine. Um, there will be a Q&A session at the end of every panel every day this week. And if you are interested in asking a question during the Q&A session, please open the chat box, which you can access again by clicking along the lower bar, um, the speech icon, and um, send a private chat message to me, Juliana Shamidas, to let me know that you'd like to be added to the queue, and I will go ahead and take note of that, okay? Um, so, Let's get started. So again, um, hello, greetings, welcome for those just joining us. Um, my name is Juliana Shamidas. I'm an associate professor of European history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And when uh, Matthew Soma and I first began organizing this event almost one year ago, we really never would have guessed how its themes would have felt so timely. Our present day public health, political and economic crisis has prompted a set of long overdue conversations about state economy relations and the presence or absence of social safety nets. It has also simultaneously brought to the fore a series of pre-existing local and global inequalities that are the result of deep history, but also of a more recent reshuffling of power relations that traces its roots to the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. So the purpose of this five day conference is to provide a broad, deep, transnational and also transregional analysis of these trends. In particular, the conference focuses on why Western European state welfareism declined and how this failure was intertwined with the ultimate failure of the global north to take up demands for the creation of what some called a form of global welfareism through the redistribution of wealth from North America and Western Europe to the global south. Uh, over the course of the next five days, we have scholars from 20 different institutions who specialize in African, Latin American, Caribbean, European, and North American history, guiding us through an attempt to engage with these issues and also address a series of related questions along the way. So some of the questions that will come up in the papers over the course of the next five days include the following. How did reactions to global migratory flows, the oil shocks of 1973 and 1979-80, and the rise of new forms of corporate power come to erode Western European state welfareist commitments? How and why did transnational left-wing and labor uh, interests react the way they did? And why did those reactions prove weak or ineffective, as others will argue? What role did the rise of the European single market play in forcing the hand of national leaders as they rushed to slash social spending, privatize public industry, and limit support for vulnerable categories from working mothers to new immigrants. In addition to broaching these causal issues and questions, all of the panelists in this five-day uh, conference are engaging with rich methodological questions that pertain to the study of transnational and global history. 
they are helping us in this project of studying Europe, not just from the inside out, but from the outside in, um, a project that many scholars uh, like Sebastian Conrad have called for. So what are the relevant economic, environmental, intellectual, and political vectors of influence and cross-pollination? That's really a key question that many of you all are grappling with. Um, in particular, how did African and Central American politicians and activists galvanize transnational conversations about the role of states' rights against private capital? How did Latin American dependency theorists cross the Atlantic to educate partners in the global north? How did Caribbean and South European immigrant activists highlight the extent to which apparently neutral social scientific research programs were in fact reifying categories of supposedly sexually and morally deviant immigrant others, which were uh, further undeserving of state assistance? Finally, how did Western European citizens, politicians, activists, scholars, and civil servants respond to the shock of the global, which emerged from the 1970s forward. Did they embrace it? Did they sanitize it? Did they reject it, et cetera? In the search for answers, our panelists will take us on a journey that jumps over traditional, national, and regional geographies and really challenges those traditional, national, and regional um, units of analysis. They'll take us to toxic waste dumps in Anatolia, to the oil rigs of the North Sea, to tourist trap safaris in Sub-Saharan Africa, and into the intimate lives of emigre grandmothers who uh, struggle to build new homes in Northern and Central European countries on short-term visas. Before I give you a quick overview of the logistics of the conference and kick off the first panel, I'd like to briefly thank those who made this event possible. The biggest thank you goes to Matthew Sohm, a brilliant PhD student at Harvard University who is completing an extraordinary dissertation that investigates post-industrial decline in the 1970s and 1980s, and argues that policymakers and businesses in the European core tried to solve a range of economic and environmental problems at home by using their influence over the continent's poorer Southern periphery. Matthew is a, an intellectual powerhouse, and he's helped me, <clears throat> excuse me, both conceptualize the conference and come up with what I'm sure you'll agree is an extraordinary, ambitious, diverse, and stimulating program. So a huge thank you to Matthew. In addition to thanking Matthew, I'd also like to extend my gratitude to Sky Doni and the Mossy program at UW-Madison, as well as UW-Madison's Department of History for making this event possible. Finally, a huge thank you to all the conference participants who despite unprecedented um, responsibilities have committed to this event and to the broader project of expanding the conversation about the history and future of social justice and state welfareism in the global framework. The conference again is spread over five days. Each day we will plan to engage in discussion from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The lines, however, will remain open till 1.30 p.m. for more informal conversation with the conference panelists. Once again, if you joined us late, some basic technical guidelines. Please mute your microphone and turn off your video if you are not a panelist or commentator on this particular day. If you would like to ask a question during the Q&A session, please open the chat box and send a private message to me, letting me know I will add you to the queue and when it's your turn to speak during the Q&A session, please unmute your microphone, turn the video on, and introduce yourself to us all before asking your question. Okay, so now without further ado, I'm gonna to get to today's panel topic, which is reinventing economic development in the 1960s and 1970s. I will briefly introduce the panel members and the commentator and then hand things over to our first speaker. So, <clears throat> Our three distinguished panelists for today are Christy Thornton, Amy Offner, and Jessica Pearson. Um, you all are visible. Um, so Christy Thornton is an assistant professor of sociology and Latin American studies at John Hopkins University. Her first book is entitled Revolution in Development, 
Mexico and the governance of the global economy. And it's going to be out in fall of 2020 with the University of California Press. So we're all very excited about that, getting our hands on that book very soon. Um, Amy C. Offner is Associate Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania. She has written Sorting Out the Mixed Economy, The Rise and Fall of Welfare and Developmental States in the Americas, which was published by Princeton in 2019 and which won the Economic History Society's first monograph prize. Her current project is entitled The Disappearing Worker, and it is a transnational history of the unraveling of the employment relationship since 1945. Jessica Pearson is Assistant Professor of History at McAllister College. Her first book is called The Colonial Politics of Global Health, France and the United Nations in Postwar Africa and it was published by Harvard University Press in 2018. She co-edited with Nicole Eggers and Aurora Almada y Santos the volume The United Nations and Decolonization, which came out with Rutledge in 2020. And she is currently working on a book manuscript which is entitled Traveling to the End of Empire, Leisure Tourism in the Era of Decolonization. And this book project explores the global entanglements between travel and the collapse of the French and British empires in the 20th century. Finally, the commentator for today's panel is Samuel Moyne, who is Henry R. Luce Professor of Jurisprudence at Yale Law School and Professor of History at Yale. Professor Moyne has written several books in his field, um, including The Last Utopia, Human Rights in History from 2020, Christian Human Rights from 2015, and Not Enough Human Rights in an Unequal World in 2018. Um, he is currently working on a new book on the origins of the idea of humane war. So a huge welcome to you all. And I will now hand things over to Christy Thornton, who will kick things off with a paper entitled The United States in Opposition, Mexico, the Third World, and the Reform of the Global Economy in the 1970s. Thanks, Juliana. Can everybody hear me? Great. Um, so I'll try to be brief since we're starting a little bit late, um, but uh, I'm really excited to be here and I really want to commend the organizers for working so hard to, um, to invite Latin Americanists and those of us who kind of stick to the Western Hemisphere into this conversation, because I do think um, there is much to be gained from crossing what I've termed elsewhere, the decolonization divide when we talk about these conversations about the impact of decolonization on questions of Europe, reading Europe from the outside in. Sometimes those of us who are Latin Americanists get kind of bracketed over into a separate conversation and we bracket ourselves, frankly. And so uh, it's really to be commended um, to the organizers for putting this all together in this way. Um, so thank you for being here. It's a little nerve wracking to be the first person to talk, but um, I'll, I'll do my best. So um, the paper that I sent for this conference um, really derives from the conclusion to my book, as Juliana mentioned, um, that's coming out this fall. I actually just sent the copy edits back this morning. So it's like really actually done. Um, and uh, so that book, Revolution and Development, Mexico and the Governance of the Global Economy, um, reads the topic of, to the, of this morning's panel, um, the idea of kind of remaking economic development all the way back into the interwar period to make an argument about the role of Mexico and other Latin American countries in really setting an agenda for what becomes the international economic development apparatus, um, going all the way back to the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. Um, but the paper that I sent today, um, as I said, derives from the conclusion um, and it uh, sort of comes from uh, a sort of disciplinary coincidence, I guess. Um, I'm trained as a historian of Latin America, but my current position, as Juliana said, is uh, in the sociology department here at Johns Hopkins. Um, and so in thinking through some of the kind of sociological entanglements that show up here, um, one important person who shows up at the very end of my book um, is Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And for those of you who might not be familiar with US history, um, with the field of sociology, Moynihan is this kind of giant figure. Um, he is a very long serving senator from New York. Um, he was prior to that actually also the US ambassador to India and then for six months for a very short period, the US ambassador to the United Nations. Um, and prior to that, um, he was an official in the Johnson administration and the Nixon administration. Um, whose area, whose purview um, is, was really kind of urban policy, 
um, and thinking about sort of civil rights era and post-civil rights urban policy. Um, and so he shows up in my story um, in this kind of pivotal moment uh, after the passage of both the Declaration on the New International Economic Order and the much more contentious passage at the UN General Assembly of the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States. Um, we tend to forget now the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States. Um, historians have argued that it's a kind of, uh, one historian called it an augmented sequel to the NIEO Declaration. People have tended to think of it as just sort of a procedural document of putting in place the New International Economic Order. Um, but what the research that I've done shows, and I talk about this in my book, um, is that the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States is actually this long, um, emerges out of this very long negotiating process um, in which state officials from Mexico play this really key role. The Me president of Mexico, Luis Echeverria, introduces the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States. Um, it's, it's drafted by these Mexican intellectuals and, and diplomats. Um, and then it's passed at the UN General Assembly um, overwhelmingly, but with a series of very key votes against it from the richest, most industrialized countries. Um, in the process of negotiating this, Mexican officials and US officials work very closely together. Um, and we have this curious thing where Henry Kissinger sort of decides that um, passing, getting a, a kind of acceptable charter of economic rights and duties of states that would be acceptable to the industrialized North and also to the third world countries, um, he sees that as sort of through his um, sort of practical, pragmatic, wanting to keep Latin America and Mexico in the purview of the United States. He's trying to find a kind of um, consensus position over this long, more than two year negotiation. But there's a whole series of people within the United States, um, importantly representatives of business organizations like the National Association of Manufacturers, the National Foreign Trade Council, various chambers of commerce, um, and congressional representatives who they are close to, um, who are really against this idea of the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States. Um, and one of the important people who kind of emerges out of this tumult is Daniel Patrick Moynihan. So, the piece, I sort of compare and contrast in the paper are these two pieces of writing that Moynihan is famous for. One is a piece that he publishes in 1975 in Commentary Magazine in the aftermath of the NEIO Declaration called The United States in Opposition. Um, it's a really remarkable piece of writing, um, and if you haven't read it, it's actually freely available on the Commentary website. You can just go um, read through it. It's, um, uh, it is really a kind of remarkable manifesto for the way that neoconservative foreign foreign policy thinkers would begin to approach the role of the United States in the world. Um, Nikhil Palsing has called it a key document in the neoconservative foreign policy revolution. Um, so in the piece, what Moynihan does is he, he basically posits that there is a growing particular form of third world socialism that the United States needs not fear the kind of um, communist takeover, but that there is this kind of particular form of nationalist third world socialism that is growing. And he says that it operates on what he calls a politics of resentment and an economics of envy. Um, and so in this way, he kind of puts forward this vision. He says, we're now outnumbered at the UN. There are now all of these countries because of decolonization. And so the United States has to go into opposition. And so he sort of puts forward a manifesto for this and um, some of the things he says in the piece, um, he calls out Mexico for its um, sort of hypocrisy in not dealing with its own internal inequality when it wants to address international inequality. Um, but the most important part of what Moynihan is really saying here um, is he's arguing against the kind of tyranny of the new majority and saying that all of the countries in the third world are gonna begin to subscribe to this kind of socialism. He says, has there ever been a conversion as complete as that of the Malay, the Igbo, the Gujarati, the Jamaican, the Australian, the Cypriot, the Guyanan, the Yemenite, the Yoruban, the Sabra, the Fellahin to this distant creed? And he argues, in fact, that um, all of these people all over the world have learned this form of socialism from post-war British labor and Fabian socialist politics. So he argues that there's kind of a distribution across the world of post-war British socialism, and that that is what the United States needs to be in opposition to. Um, and so uh, he concludes by saying, at root, the ideas of exploitation and discrimination represent a, tra a transfer to colonial populations of the fundamental socialist assertions with respect to the condition of the European working class, just as the idea of independence parallels the demand that the working class break out of bondage 
and rise to power. So he's sort of making this um, sort of internal class-based analysis, scaling it up to the world and arguing that the United States needs to fight against that. And in fact, that is a, a, an analysis that, for instance, the actors I study in Mexico, they themselves use. Um, and so um, he argues that the countries of the third world have to be sort of forced to embrace liberal values otherwise and, and reject the kind of managed economy that they have been championing unless they, quote, become permanently dependent on outside assistance. Um, and so the whole tone of this piece is actually remarkable when you put it in contrast with the other document that Moynihan is most famously known for, which is a document that was written in 1965 internally within the Johnson administration in the aftermath of the passage of various civil rights legislation. Um, and that document um, is called The Negro Family, The Case for National Action. Um, in sociology, this is a very emblematic document. It touches off this massive debate um, over, actually the term blaming the victim is coined in response to this Moynihan report. Um, and here he's arguing about, he sort of puts forward, um, amplifies Oscar Lewis's culture of poverty influence. And again, he talks about resentment, envy, and welfare dependence. Um, and so I think that what I would, what I'm interested in doing in this paper and what I'm interested in doing in having this broader conversation is seeing the extent to which Cold War liberals, of which Moynihan is absolutely a part, right? He is a Democrat who um, serves in multiple administrations, but he thinks of himself in sort of a core way as a civil rights Democrat, that he is arguing for kind of equality of outcomes um, and he wants to find ways to do this. In the Negro family, he calls the black family a tangle of pathologies, but he argues that um, what's needed in the end is a kind of national jobs program that will give black men um, better employment opportunities so that they can be responsible patriarchal heads of household and take care of the disintegrating family and that that will then solve this kind of tangle of pathologies. So I'm interested in kind of putting these two documents together, Moynihan's understanding of the black family in the civil in the post civil rights era and his understanding of the third world and the kind of pathologies of the third world politics of resentment and envy in the new international economic order um, to begin to make a connection and i one of the ways that i think about this is through the work of Amy Offner, who's here on the panel, um, and Stuart Schrader, who I happen to know very well, um, who uh, have both written about the politics of self-help as um, a kind of key idea in post-war, Cold War liberalism. Um, and that's, I think, one thing that we can see in both of these documents that we see um, a kind of neoconservative foreign policy taking up the idea of self-help as against the welfare world, as Gunnar Myrdal called it, um, very much paralleling the idea of a kind of fear of welfare dependence on the part of kind of undeserving and deviant um, people who are racially othered. And so I think that there's an interesting parallel to be drawn here. Um, I've just started this kind of work research, as I said, I just turned in my book of copy edits. So I've just begun to think about how we might consider this connection between the way that um, somebody like Moynihan steeped in kind of post-civil rights liberal domestic policy might then transfer that understanding onto the role of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the third world. Um, and I think that that kind of question can begin to open up um, interesting questions about the neoconservative movement that sees itself, neoconservative and neoliberal movements that see themselves as against the welfare state and against state managed economies and against welfare provision. Um, so in both cases, the kind of wave one of the things that I think is really interesting, and I'll just finish here, is that in both of these cases, um, both Moynihan's understanding of the black family and in his rejection of third worldist uh, economic policy, one of the things that's really interesting is that the right wing backlash that takes him up, even if it's not necessarily what he himself is interested in doing, the right wing thinkers at the American Enterprise Institute, et cetera, who, who take him up, um, they, this backlash comes even after there are attempts by both um, civil rights leaders domestically and by countries like Mexico vis-a-vis -vis the third world to actually moderate some of the more radical demands, right? So there's a sense in which 
um, demands are being put forward are being moderated already on the terms that Moynihan is putting out, and yet they're not enough. And they result in this kind of very strong backlash that we see when we have the rise of Thatcher and Reagan, et cetera. Um, and so I think that one of the things that really draws this together is um, in both cases, the United States is kind of, and the white power structure is pitched as the aggrieved minority, dominated arithmetically, as Moynihan says, by those who were previously held in check by colonialism on the one hand and Jim Crow on the other. And conservatives really take up the ideas that Moynihan puts out into the world and take the first steps towards, I think, the politics that today really begin to animate Trumpism. So I think by trying to return to these origin points and try and begin to draw these points of connection, we might get a fuller picture of how we got to the mess that we're in today. Thanks. Thanks so much, Christy. That was brilliant. Um, so we will, I should have made this clear, we'll hear from all three of the panelists and from the commentator, and then we will open up the floor for questions. Um, so next up is Amy Offner, whose paper is entitled Remaking the State, A View from the Americas. Okay, uh, is my sound working all right? Yes, okay, great. Um, so thank you so much, Juliana and Matthew for putting this together. Thanks, Christy, for going first. It's so great to be on a panel with you and to see you virtually. Um, my work, of course, deals with the Americas and not with Europe. So my comments are gonna be uh, primarily methodological and historiographic, and they're based on the work of a number of colleagues, including Christy's work, um, as well as my own book that I published um, in last fall. So I'll start with a few words about the book and the historiography that it's a part of. And then what I wanna do is um, suggest three new directions that I think might be fruitful for people who are trying to write histories across the North-South divide and across the 1970s. Sorting out the mixed economy is, um, it offers a new understanding of the way that governments in the capitalist economies of the United States and Colombia first took on widening functions during the decades after 1945, and then how their functions were dismantled, reassigned, and redefined after the 1970s. Ultimately, the book makes two central points. First, it reveals the influence of Latin American developmentalism on the formation of the U.S. welfare state and on the intellectual and political life of the Atlantic. Second, the book argues that a number of practices that are regarded today as quintessentially neoliberal inventions had earlier lives as developmentalist phenomena. It finds things that we tend not to remember about mid-century statecraft, including austere systems of social welfare provision, evolving methods of state decentralization, and novel forms of for-profit and private delegation of state functions. These were in fact state building techniques for decades after the Great Depression, and after the 1970s, they were selectively appropriated, redeployed, and politically resignified to become emblematic features of neoliberal capitalism. So in that sense, I agree with Johanna Bachman that neoliberal capitalism was a parasitic formation that owed unspoken debts to the very order it destroyed. Historiographically, my work is part of a new wave of writing that looks at the United States as an American society. That is to say, as part of a hemisphere entwined with Latin America for the very simple reason that the United States and Latin America are twin products of the same historical processes from European colonization onward. This work resituates the U.S. outside a North Atlantic frame, and it also resituates Latin America, insisting on that region's influence on global processes of state formation and political economic change. So I think of my book as something that should be read alongside work by Christie, also uh, Margarita Fajardo, who's here with us this week, and many others whose work I discuss in somewhat more depth in the paper, and I'll make maybe briefer reference to here, but you know, certainly Greg Brandon, Daniel Rodriguez, Catherine Marino, Tori Olson, Karen Rosenblatt, and many others who collectively uh, make a variety of different arguments, but certainly insist that Latin America was not a receptacle for ideas about social rights, social democracy, or post-colonial systems of uh, global governance, but rather a source of those ideas. This work, as I said, is pretty diverse, but a few overarching interpretive claims are emerging. One is a general, although not universal, retreat from the idea that resistance was the essential dynamic between North and South, or that historians may easily look to Latin America to find egalitarian roads not taken. Greg Grandin and Catherine Marino 
do assign Latin America a rather heroic role in world history, but others find more contradiction in Latin Americans' international roles. So Rebecca Herman, Renata Keller, and Christy Thornton show, among other things, that repressive governments in Latin America at times relied on foreign policy to demonstrate their progressivism while they battled left-wing and anti-racist movements at home. Um, Tori Olson argues that much of what we know as the Green Revolution owed to Mexican policymakers who adapted the prescriptions of the Rockefeller Foundation and in doing so made them much more punishing to small farmers. My own research illuminates the deeply inegalitarian ideals of Colombian capitalists and economists who built that country's developmental state during the 1950s and 1960s. I think of their relationship with North Atlantic powers and institutions, not as one of resistance, but really as a quintessentially imperial relationship. These Latin American elites were engaged in class conflict within their own society, and they used relationships in the North Atlantic to strengthen their hand in battles that they couldn't otherwise win. So with that brief background, um, I wanna discuss a few possible directions for future research. First is um, new geographies. I think that historians of welfare and developmental states might make more than most of us at least have of the analytic opportunities afforded by the Caribbean, which is of course a, a crossroads that's very central to world history. Tomorrow's paper by Chelsea Shields, I think is a really brilliant example of what this kind of research can reveal and reading it with Christie's work is especially um, interesting. The Caribbean I think offers intriguing possibilities to historians who want to bring together post-colonial interpretations of U.S. and European welfare states. Because after all, it is not only in international institutions, but it's also in the Caribbean, where we can see um, U.S. and European powers reckoning simultaneously with each other and with their own imperial subjects. Moreover, because decolonization occurred on multiple timelines in the Caribbean, it's a place where we can cross what Christie has uh, termed the decolonization divide. It's a very natural site to study connections and exchanges among countries and colonies that shared no particular political status, but were tied together through patterns of investment, labor migration, political mobilization, and inter-imperial policy exchange. A second direction for research is the study of what I think of as indirect uh, connections between societies. And when I say indirect connections, what I mean is that in my own research, it became clear that ideas and practices traveled between the U.S. and Latin America in ways that were far more pervasive than what historians generally assume. Today, um, the kind of leading transnational studies of public policy and intellectual life explore direct on-the-nose exchanges between discrete fields of activity and thought. So they show us urban planners exchanging ideas across borders. They show us agrarian reforms learning from, uh, from one another. Um, and that research has taught us a lot, but it only allows us to see connections in times and places where societies defined their problems in similar ways. And that I think is a really um, uh, a significant problem because we know that very often societies conceptualize their problems in quite different ways. And to me, a case in point is the problem of uh, poverty after 1945. As Christy mentioned, in the post-war U.S., poverty was very rarely recognized as a systemic product of political economic order. Instead, the country's leading social scientists and policymakers regarded poverty as an aberrant feature of a growing capitalist economy, and they attributed it to the supposed pathologies of poor people themselves. By contrast, in Latin America, poverty was conventionally understood first and foremost as an outgrowth of the structure of the economy and the project of development was centrally about creating new productive sectors and transforming the country's position in international trade. Those incommensurate understandings of poverty meant that some forms of knowledge and experience could never traverse national borders in any direct way. Development economics never had much influence on scholarly thinking about poverty within the United States. But nevertheless, I did find that the training of economists in Latin America and the growth of development economics there did shape anti-poverty policy in the United States. But the connection was a kind of chain reaction or an indirect connection. The professionalization of economics in Latin America after the Great Depression generated a ferocious reaction from businessmen because the rise of economists threatened to expel uh, managers and other businessmen from economic policy-making positions that they had occupied for many decades 
As a result, Colombian managers organized their own rival professionalization project within post-war universities, which was founded on the idea that management was a universal technique that could rationalize any institution, including the state itself. Colombian businessmen insinuated themselves into public development agencies and public universities, turning those emblems of developmentalist statecraft into symbols of private capital's capacity to serve public purposes. And it's at this point that I found connections to the U.S. welfare state. U.S. business organizations were deeply involved in the professionalization of both economists and managers in Latin America. Their experience with business mobilization in the third world and their experience also as contractors in development projects in the third world gave them a distinctive perspective on the crises that they confronted at home during the 1960s when, of course, the corporation came under virulent attack from the left. Veterans of foreign and imperial affairs realized that to survive and thrive in an age of social upheaval, they needed to enter the state, conduct its work, and map their profit-making activities onto the demands of social movements. And as I show, during the war on poverty, these sectors of U.S. capital became pioneers in the invention of for-profit educational contracting in the U.S., something that was not born of right-wing mobilization, but rather of transferring a pattern of for-profit contracting from foreign and imperial affairs into the welfare state as a way of building the welfare state during its heyday. These connections between Latin American developmentalism and U.S. public education policy were real and consequential, but they were difficult to research because U.S. businessmen were transposing lessons from one domain to another. They aren't connections that a historian of education would easily find or a historian of economic thought uh, because they involved extensive translation. And so my point here is simply that historians, I think, would do well to look for other such forms of indirect connection because we know that very often societies don't conceptualize their problems in similar ways, but can still be connected across many lines of difference. And then the finally, final possibility for new research um, that I want to mention is the study of memory. I had no intention of studying historical memory when I started my research, but I've come to see it as really essential to anybody trying to understand political economy uh, since 1945. The epilogue to my book attempts to explain why we don't remember the mid-century origins of practices like for-profit educational contracting. And it argues that our understandings of these practices are a very recent vintage. They were forged in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s in the very process of dismantling welfare and developmental states. And that's because the work of political economic restructuring involved a great deal of storytelling about what the mid-century state had been. So I find storytellers, for instance, among the economists in the Bretton Woods institutions and among businessmen as well, these figures crafted self-affirming narratives that celebrated the 70s, 80s, and 90s as a time when they turned the world upside down. And what's interesting is that those celebratory narratives have in turn come to inform critics of neoliberalism, who I think in a righteous manner tell much the same story, but in a minor key. They invert all the sort of normative values in the story. Critical histories of the right have, in that sense, performed really vital political work. Um, but they tend to reinforce the essential claims of triumphalist narratives, presenting the same periodization of the 20th century and attributing political economic change to the same set of actors. And the result is a form of historical memory that is neither of the right nor of the left, but is rather a shared way of imagining the recent past that is today foundational to contemporary political conflict. And as historians who are living in this moment, we are just soaking in this form of historical memory. This was my understanding of history when I started my research. Um, and I think that that is a real challenge to those of us who are trying to write about the rise and fall of welfare and developmental states. I think that our task is both to analyze the history of political economy and state formation, and also to analyze popular tellings of history that shape and often constrain our own inquiry into the past. So with that, I'll pass it to, uh, uh, pass it along. Thank you, Amy. So next up is Jess Pearson. Her paper is entitled Your African Entanglements and Postcolonial Development, The Durability of Empire 1960 to 1980. Great, thank you. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Um, thanks so much, Juliana. Uh, Christy, I really appreciate what you said about bridging the decolonization divide. Um, I'm actually in Ecuador right now um, on the on the last uh, last week of my year-long sabbatical, and it happens to be Ecuadorian um, independent. 
So um, happy Dias de Agosto to everyone. Um, so for the last 10 years, I've really been thinking about European decolonization through the lens of diplomatic history. Um, and I'm, as I'm beginning my new book project on the history of tourism, I'm starting to think more about the end of empire in relationship to questions of economic development. So I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to be here today um, and to benefit from the wisdom of my co-panelists. Um, so I'm going to talk about what I call your African entanglements in two different development sectors, health and tourism. In both cases, development served as a means for European diplomatic and commercial interests to retain a foothold in Africa after independence. My work on health, which is connected to my first book, focuses on the World Health Organization and its role in Africa. So I'm going to start by offering just a brief glimpse into this organization in the years that followed the independence of most of Europe's sub-Saharan colonies, beginning around 1960. Well, theoretically, the transition to independent statehood also heralded a new era of health. European representatives continued to participate in the annual meetings of the WHO's Regional Committee for Africa, and they did so until 1970. Under the rubric of member states still having responsibility in the region, both Britain and France extended their direct involvement in the field of African public health through their participation in the WHO. There, they sowed seeds of tension between Francophone and Anglophone African states, thus limiting the possibilities for inter-African cooperation around questions of health. The first meeting of the regional committee after the largest wave of African independences took place in Brazzaville in 1961, and it was attended by both European and African representatives. In the first minutes of the program, Dr. Somine Dolo, who is the Malian Minister of Public Health, acknowledged the potential awkwardness of having Africa's former colonizers in attendance at the meeting. And this is how he, uh, this is what he stated. 21 African states, compared to only five last year, are constitutionally able to defend the interests of their countries in the regional committee. In the sanitary domain, however, the current picture remains obscured by the presence of a certain number of people who wrongfully claim a right to represent certain African territories. I hope that they will not be present in 1962. Surprisingly, however, African hostility to the European presence at the meeting softened considerably by the end, and Mali's delegation closed the gathering with a statement of immense enthusiasm about the possibility for ongoing collaboration with the French in the years to come. The magnetic pull of colonial relationships into the post-colonial period has been well documented by historians. So this leaves us with a question. Did independence produce a meaningful shift in the way that health cooperation operated in post-colonial Africa? While I've moved away from public health in my own research, I can offer a few suggestions for other scholars exploring this topic, especially in a moment when a lot of new archives in Africa. First and foremost, we need to build a clearer picture of how both governments and African citizens understood the shift to an independent system of public health, one that in theory would be free from colonial interference. Was the ongoing involvement of former colonial powers perceptible to the people who relied on these health systems? And did they see ongoing political drama at the regional office as a factor that would potentially limit their access to WHO programs and resources? And finally, how did African medical personnel navigate these relationships as they sought to build health systems that would respond to local public health imperatives? As European doctors worked to carve out a more metaphorical space for European medicine in post-colonial Africa, European travel companies, airlines, and hotel developers were staking a claim to a more literal space on the African continent. In the two decades that followed independence, they partnered with Africans to build a tourism industry that would cater almost exclusively to white travelers. In some African tourism industry widened the divide between Africans and their former colonizers. In others, however, the expansion of global travel offered Africans an opportunity to launch their own economic development on um, what they saw as their own terms. Beyond the potential economic advantages that post-independence tourism offered, foreign travel to Africa also presented a more symbolic opportunity to project a particular identity to a global audience. Postcolonial tourism, at least on the surface, seemed to offer a chance to upend decades of colonial travel propaganda that had aimed to justify European rule and paint the colonies as exotic yet backwards destinations to be consumed by tourists from the metropole. For many people living in newly independent nations, the ability to shape a tourist experience offered a chance to reject the framework of the civilizing mission that had so long characterized travel to these regions of the world. Yet tourism's ability to foster new solidarities and carve out new national identities would meet with significant 
limitations as unequal partnerships with former colonizers would prove difficult to shake. Within the air travel industry, for example, many independent states continue to rely on European loans to buy European aircraft and on European facilities to train their crew members. Efforts to develop infrastructure for tourists often led these states to seek both expertise and financial support from their former colonizer. Starting in the mid-1960s, for example, the British government consulted on and invested in the construction of airports and hotels and in the development of game reserves in former British colonies. Beyond this more tangible web of post-colonial dependencies was another unfortunate reality. Travel did not always produce mutual comprehension between tourists and local communities. Indeed, development in the travel industry depended on inviting former colonizers to take up space on land that had only recently become sovereign territory. As Europeans seized upon their right to leisure, and this is where I think um, there's an important connection to this um, idea of the welfare state, they also began embarking on um, voyages to new destinations. And many of them traveled with mentalities um, held over from previous decades of colonial violence and domination. Still, for many Africans, the ability to host their former colonizers on independent African soil provided an opportunity to rethink these previous relationships. As we continue to build on a body of scholarship about development and decolonization, I think that it's complicated is probably a safe description of the ongoing relationship between African states and Europe. But rather than write development off as an entirely neo-colonial project, I think that we should also continue to account for African agency. In 1970, a Dakar-based magazine entitled Africa ran a series of articles about hotel construction and on the possibility of developing tourism as a third industry for independent Senegal. So I'm going to end with a quote from one of these articles that I think speaks really clearly to this question of African agency. Tourism is an economic field, undoubtedly the only one, where Africans can compete with developed countries on an equal playing field, or we could say in full dignity. Africa possesses attributes that these countries do not or no longer possess, sun, the draw of the new, folklore. In fact, we can almost say that the civilization of leisure in which the industrialized world is engaged is a veritable source of luck for underdeveloped countries like Senegal. What this quote reminds us, I think, is that these ongoing entanglements uh, between Europe and Africa did in some ways prolong African independence, sorry, African dependence um, on its former colonizers, especially in the domain of economics. In other ways, however, they offered Africans a chance to rethink their relationship to Europe and to mobilize changing European notions of health and leisure to their own advantage. And I'll stop here for the sake of time, but thank you so much for listening and I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Thank you, Jess. Sam, you have the floor. Okay, am, am I audible? Yes. Excellent. Well, what a, an amazingly organized conference and uh, a great uh, panel with which to begin because of the unexpected, you know, perspective the papers provide on on the conference theme. I'm going to do the boring thing and just make a few comments and pose a few questions about um, how the papers do shed light on or raise questions about the conference theme. So, starting with Amy, it's utterly persuasive, obviously, that uh, U.S historians have have looked too much uh, east and not enough south and I, one one initial question is whether scholars of the european welfare state are guilty of the reverse mistake looking too much west rather than uh, to their own souths i i doubt that that mistake is as ingrained amongst europeanists as it is amongst historians of the united states but it's it's still real and uh, either way, I infer from Amy that Europeanists need a lot more scholarship than we have relating the rise and decline of the European welfare state to the spaces of their formal and, and informal empires. In an, in an initial stage in the hierarchical policies and circulating knowledge in colonial welfare schemes and later then between Europeans and post-colonial states, Obviously, we have a little bit of scholarship of this kind, Jordana Bailkin, Todd Shepard, not much else that I know about, but clearly all the points Amy makes about the limits of a resistance frame and the importance of, of what I'd call a more clientelistic one are pertinent in thinking about Europe's north-south relations and the era of the making of their, those welfare states and indirect connections would also be you know, essential to look into. 
Then uh, in Amy's paper, there's the question of continuities across the neoliberal divide. And, and she's brilliantly corrected a cartoonish or stereotypical version where the welfare state, and here stereotypically, a European welfare state, is perfect and strong, and then a few economists descend from Mont Pelerin in the 1970s. That's false, um, and yet Europeanists have not kind of um, told the nuanced story in the way that Amy's told it uh, now for the, uh, the other hemisphere. Um, even so, you know, I still think no one should um, minimize the significance of the 1970s or how radical the change in fact was. There was a change and Europeanists are right to not just dwell on continuities, but also discontinuities. And that's what this conference presumably is about. Okay, so turning to Christie's paper, you know, never have enough critical uh, scholarship about Pat Moynihan and, it, and you've done an amazing job relating his critique of the domestic welfare state with, with the new international economic order uh, uh, pr proposals and, and related things. So three comments, questions. First, um, you recall, I, th I don't think you mentioned in your comments today that Moynihan analogizes post-colonial projects both at their national level and then at the global scale to European socialism, especially Fabianism. So I think it's worth asking whether he was right about that. Have we as historians um, substantiated or contradicted him? So other people besides Christie's Mexican uh, observers like Gunnar Myrdal or Julius Sinieri understood post-colonial political economy on, on some kind of analogy with European class politics. But, you know, maybe they were the exceptions, um, not the rule. Um, and then there are these two other questions I thought about in relation to your paper. First, were there European Moynihans um, for whom turning against the third world and their own welfare states went together. Um, I'm sure there were, but it, 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 you, the vivid example raises the question vividly for European cases. And then secondly, what were the interactions between America's neoconservative and neoliberal turn, which was real in the 1970s and European relations with it, uh, their post colonies? And I just don't think we know tons about this. Um, lastly, on Jessica's paper, um, what a what a stimulating uh, intervention. I guess I I goofed because she said it's complicated in her comments. I read it much more as, um, in a sense, saying something almost opposite from Christie that neo-colonialism proved more powerful uh, as a European heritage in the post-colony than than socialism did. Um, including in the relation uh, after decolonization between Europe and, and the post colony. So your, your, your exploration of health and tourism, which are both really interesting, uh, I wondered if they force us to put the showier new international economic order um, in, it, in its place. Um, it's gotten a lot of love in recent scholarship um, and yet your examples help substantiate Amy's insistence that we look for continuities over the post-war period, deep roots to neo-imperial phenomena we might associate um, too exclusively with too late a period. But again, you know, your work shows how much um, exciting um, scholarship is being done on just these intricate questions like the other two papers. I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Sam. So far, we have two people on the queue. Uh, first is Laurent Warlouze. You can take the mic. And if you could also just very briefly introduce yourself to everyone. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah, great. Uh, thank Juliana and Matthew for um, having invited me. So uh, I'm thrilled to, to be here. I'm uh, currently professor of history in Paris, uh, but I have to confess that I am not at all an expert uh, of the, 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 the issue raised by the, the three papers. Uh, I'm of Western 
uh, neoliberal Europe, the transition to neoliberal Europe, uh, or the absence of transition of the to neoliberal Europe in the 70s and 80s. And uh, actually, I have um, um, two questions to, for Amy and one for uh, Jessica. Um, uh, rather mundane questions, I have to admit. Uh, uh, the first to, uh, to Amy is about uh, poverty. You mentioned that the definition of poverty was different between the US uh, and uh, Latin America for uh, ideological reasons. Uh, but I was also wondering whether um, um, to what extent this difference uh, could not also be explained by um, the shared difference in terms of wealth. Uh, because today, uh, well, at least it is the case today. Today, if you um, uh, want to define poverty at the UN level, at the world level, poverty usually de defined by uh, in incapacity to fulfill basic needs. Uh, so you you have to earn less than two dollar a day. Whereas in many rich countries, it is defined in terms of percentage of the median income. Uh, so, for example, in France, it's, it's, it is roughly 1,000 euros per month for uh, a single individual. Um, so, yeah, I would like to, to know a, a little bit more about the, those possible um, uh, overlaps in terms of definition of poverty. And the second point is about, uh, very simply, the growing role of um, private company for-profit company in development policies in terms of uh, ideological debate can you trace the growing influence of um, the uh, public school choice approach uh, the uh, um, what you call sometimes the Virginia school which criticizes the efficiency of uh, of public actors uh, in debate uh, or in uh, in in the academia or in uh, in discourse and uh, to Jessica uh, I just want to know more about the economics and uh, also the strategic aims of uh, the, the airline you, you, you study, uh, Air Africa, because supporting an airline is, is not always um, uh, cost effective, uh, but it, it is important also from a political point of view to assert uh, the, the state national sovereignty. I remember a paper by Alessandro Yandolo about Soviet aid to Guinea, uh, so in the same area you, you, you've studied, in which he explains that Soviet experts were disappointed because the, the Guinean leader, Sekuture, spent most of the first batch of aid to build an airport and to buy airplanes. So uh, uh, it, it, means, it means that uh, um, having an, uh, an airline uh, was very important to assert uh, also the, the the newly acquired sovereignty of those new uh, new states. So, just a very uh, general question about uh, the uh, this airline Air Africa, and I'm done. So, Amy or Jess, either one of you can give an answer, and then we'll move to the next question. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, uh, actually, to both uh, Sam and Laurent for these questions. I'll try to respond briefly to um, to them. Um, I'll start with Laurent. Um, you're absolutely right that the reason that poverty was conceptualized differently in the United States and Latin America in the post-war period is that uh, macroeconomic measures were so central to the understanding of poverty. And for that reason, by the 1950s, in the United States, social scientists and policymakers could very easily say the United States is not a poor country. Um, if you're looking at GDP, if you're looking at growth, the United States is not a poor country. Um, and of course, there were poor people in the United States. There were some number of poor people and poor communities. And the um, kind of like kind of world altering fiction, the, the really important myth that guides US policymakers is that um, those pockets of poverty are um, not products of a growing economy. I mean, of course, the US economy, we know, like, produced both wealth and poverty, right? It was a, like poverty was a systemic outgrowth of the way that growth was being organized in the United States, but they denied that fact. And so what they said was that, you know, there's something aberrant and outside actually, there's something exceptional about these people and these spaces that makes them 
um, examples of poverty within plenty. And so as a result, knowledge about poverty in the United States was not, um, it wasn't a field that was dominated by like economists who were interested in macroeconomic questions. It was a space that was dominated by the people that, that Christie's talking about. It was sociologists, political scientists, anthropologists, people who were seen to have knowledge about poor people and about strategies for transforming them. Many of them were psychologists seeking kind of personal transformation. Others were people who were trying to do community development programs and so on. So you're absolutely right, the kind of um, the rise of macroeconomic measurement and the possibility of making um, international comparisons in, in those terms meant that in the United States, knowledge about poverty was very different than knowledge in Latin America, where you could say we are a poor country and therefore, when you try and understand the situation of a poor person in this country, the ultimate cause is the status of the nation, which needs to be changed. Um, when you ask about the role of private capital in education, the role of private capital in development policies in general is, is something of great interest to me, and you see it everywhere. And I wouldn't say that there's a growing role of private capital over time. There are just shifting roles for private capital. And that's why I use the concept of the mixed economy to talk about mid-century developmentalism, um, because the, the, the explicit ideal on which policymakers were working was the idea that they were trying to walk a path between socialism and laissez-faire. So they're constantly trying to articulate state and capital as a way of building the welfare state or the developmental state. It's a it's an ideal and not a, a, a kind of retreat. It's their it's their their goal. Um, in terms of education, you're totally right that there are many routes to um, like contemporary prescriptions for educational privatization. So like the Virginia school has its own kind of um, origin story. And the difference is this: the Virginia school prides itself on that. They tell that story. They say that they are the single root of it. And the guys that I look at erase the past. Um, and that is, I think, one of the challenges when Sam says, you know, the 70s is a moment of rupture. One of the challenges I think before us is trying to think about how to fit the story of the kind of self-conscious celebratory right into how do they connect with these other um, origin stories that are full of erasure, basically. So the way that I trace out the connections between these like 60s experiments in, in for-profit educational contracting and later is actually through the institutional um, transformation of the companies themselves, which you can trace straight from the for-profit educational contracting um, experiments of the war on poverty into like the birth of Pearson and um, standardized testing companies that make huge money after the 90s from you know, basically um, standardization and testing um, and, and the many contracting opportunities that come out of that. So there's multiple kind of intersecting groups here and, and you're right about that. And just briefly to sort of respond to Sam's point, um, you know, I'm not a Europeanist and I, I hesitate to sort of generalize about whether Europeanists have made a mistake of thinking of themselves too much in a North Atlantic context. I don't think, my, my sense is that Europeanists, one of the, maybe um, characteristic features of Eurocentrism is that it's not Euro, it's not US centric. <laughs> so I don't think that the United States is as much of a touch point for Europeans as, as the other way. Um, and I also do think that there are different intellectual problems that emerge for a European is trying to think um, North South than for a US historian trying to think North South because what's distinctive about the Western hemisphere is that these societies are products of the same processes, you know, the sort of they were colonized contemporaneously, the slave trade and the sort of creation of Creole elites that have a sort of um, a revolutionary consciousness that affirms their own power and then all of the post-colonial conflicts that come out of that. These are just totally identical processes that play out somewhat, you know, differently, obviously, within the hemisphere. And then simultaneously, you have imperial relationships within the hemisphere. And so the United States has a, it has a both a rivalrous sibling relationship to Latin America that's kind of absent from like the European relationship to Asia or to um, Africa. And it also has an imperial relationship, which is not unlike the kind of Eastern hemisphere relationships. One place where I think there might be a similar dynamic though, um, where um, Europeanists might take something from the Western hemisphere is this. Um, I see Latin America as this workshop of what we think of as like neoliberal kinds of social welfare provision for the reason that during the developmentalist era, the terms of international lending, um, trade and investment were such that national income was very limited and the understanding of development was such that you had to concentrate, they, they said, you had to concentrate your national income in you know, industrialization, in infrastructure and so on. So 
programs like housing, health, education were like systematically starved. You've got to provide these things, but you have to do it as cheaply as you possibly can in the third world. And that's the reason that you get so many really diminutive programs that like cost nothing and promise to have like millions and millions of people coming out of the third world. And then I find them sort of being redeployed in the war on poverty in the United States. And I suspect that you might find similar dynamics elsewhere because that's a common condition for the third world. You have to meet hugely rising expectations with like totally not enough money. Thanks, Amy. So we are um, going over the one hour slot that um, that I promised everyone. If one of the panelists needs to jump off for other obligations, we understand. But if you are able to stick with us, we have at least um, three more questions. And of course, um, Jess and Christy may also have responses to the questions that have been posed so far. So I don't know, maybe Jess, you want to take the mic and then Christy, you'll decide if you'd like the mic or if you want to just hand it over to the next person. Go ahead, Jess. Okay, sure. Um, thanks, Lauren, so much for that question about um, the strategic aims of Air Afrique. Um, I think one of the things I'm, I've loved about that uh, a lot of the sources I looked at for my first book were um, just reports of how many people died of malaria every year. Um, so I've been really excited to get into some of the um, the travel related materials. So um, I can say a few things about this question of um, you know national sovereignty and air travel. So one of the things I'm looking at is Air Freaks in flight magazine. Um, and what's really interesting is you see this very stark divide between what's in the articles and what's in the advertisements. Um, so all the articles are champion are championing this idea of like tourism um, for Africans by Africans in Africa. Um, that's focused on the like post-colonial futures and pre-colonial pasts. Um, but it's very interesting because all of the ads are for luxury European goods. Um, so there are ads for French champagne and Swiss watches, um, British cars, things like that. So um, it's very interesting to just see that divide. Um, and then also just on a really basic level in terms of who owns the airline, um, it's actually jointly owned by 13 francophone African countries. Uh, Cameroon uh, spins off first and creates its own national airline and withdraws from Air Afrique. Um, but it's also jointly owned by Air France. And the share that Air France owns grows over time as the airline is in um, increasing economic and financial trouble. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to say is I'm also thinking about the people that work for the airline. So um, just to give like one little um, vignette. In 1980, um, the flight attendants that work for Air Afrique get together and what they want to protest is the airline's policy that they are not allowed to have more than two children. Uh, the idea was that if you had more than two children, you weren't really able to commit to this like jet setting lifestyle of like being in the air all the time. Um, you were going to be more, you know, devoted to motherhood on the ground. Um, and so uh, the Pope is going to be coming to Cote d'Ivoire in 1980 and they get together all of the flight attendants and they write a letter to the Pope and they want the Pope to intervene on their behalf. Um, and I haven't actually found out what happened. Like, I don't know if the Pope writes them back or if the Pope meets with them or like if anything comes of this, I've just found sort of like the beginning um, archival trace to this, but it's definitely something that I want to think about more. So how are the people that are working for the airline as employees thinking about themselves as working for like a, 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 a joint African European corporation? What does this mean in terms of how they mobilize um, as labor? So thank you so much for that question. Um, I'll just respond very quickly because I want to get to the other questions, but um, I love Sam's questions and I think that they should, I, I would hope that they might motivate some of the conversations that we're going to have over the next couple of days because as a non-Europeanist, I literally don't know the answers. So um, I'm very interested, you know, the idea of uh, are there European Moynihan's see this parallel between the kind of, um, undeserving domestic underclass and the um, and the formerly colonized populations. I mean, I think that one place we might begin to look for that is in Quinn Slobodian's work and particularly in the new work about um, sort of racialized understandings, uh, the kind of particular racialized um, neoliberalism that emerges, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Southern Africa. Um, that might be a place to begin to look for that stuff. And so I hope maybe Quinn will chime in at some point and help us answer that question. Um, and on the connection between um, the sort of neoconservatives and neoliberals um, in this moment and it's and how the relationship with the developing world is a kind of key crux there. I think that's really important. And one of the things that you see within the United States, and I don't know if there are similar 
questions in Europe. But one of the things that you see in the United States is the emergence as you go in the 1960s and then in the 1970s, right, um, are these, um, amend these various amendments introduced by members of Congress to national legislation about how foreign aid can be used. And they begin to very much constrict, right, if countries are not using the kind of appropriate self-help measures, if they are seen as kind of just wanting a handout and seen as being kind of welfare dependent, then the United States is gonna introduce these measures to make it so that, you know, precious US taxpayer dollars can't just be given freely out to these, you know, deviant countries in the third world. And I think Trumpism is really a good distillation of this as we see um, the sort of very clear um, parallels that he makes between kind of American carnage and the undeserving cities and, you know, all of the things that he said vis-a-vis -vis what's going on this summer. And then the understanding of, for instance, cutting off aid to the countries in Central America in the middle of the migration crisis, right? So the idea that, you know, the United States purse is this kind of precious thing to be guarded um, and that giving it to these undeserving people, both, you know, underclasses within the United States and in the developing world, I think that really is a tie together here. And one of the things that I'm trying to get at vis-a-vis -vis Moynihan, and more importantly, the, the kind of people who take up the Moynihan mantle. And I would love to know what the parallels are in the European situation to that. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Christy. Um, as another preview and person to whom we might turn for that precise question, um, Chelsea Shields, I understand, is working on a book on Moynihan in Europe. So that'll be really exciting. Um, so we have three to four more people on the queue. Um, Stefan, you're up next. Go ahead. Great. Thank you, Juliana. I think, wait, I have to permit the um, video to come up. There it is. Uh, thank you, Juliana. Uh, so um, I'm Stefan Tetzlaff. I'm, I did a PhD on uh, Indian history and just finished a project on the new kinds of capitalism in India uh, that emerged in the post-independence period after 1947. And my next project is um, to historicize the varieties of capitalism debate with particular reference to European uh, social capitalisms. So, which is also why I'm uh, happy to attend today and uh, this week and listen to what you're presenting. So I was really uh, fascinated by all three presentations. Initially, I was only commenting, thought this comment would go to Amy Offner's presentation, but I think it's uh, there's a larger currency behind the question. And the question is about economists and their relation US economists are being trained in the US and their work in Latin America. So the uh, Chicago boys are the example. Uh, I was immediately thinking of, of any example of uh, Chicago boys in other Latin American countries, or if uh, other Latin American countries were more influenced by different disciplines, say history, sociology. So Moynihan, for example, was a historian, uh, trained as a historian, and did this reflect in the advice they gave I think Moynihan was part of the Ford Foundation. Uh, so if you would construct it, the Chicago boys were free market guys. So they would not directly give influence, but they would train people and send them to Chile to make the reforms. I mean, that's something which I think would be uh, one would need to consider in the, in the, uh, in the if you think about this, in, in which groups influence which uh, trajectories. Uh, so in the, the Berkeley mafia is then, becomes important for Indonesia. So there is a global historical context in which this comes up uh, in the 60s and 70s. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll offer a few thoughts. Um, certainly, Chicago's influence all around Latin America. Um, Latin American economists from many countries went and studied at Chicago. One of the interesting things that, um, that I tried to that actually was the fact that until Pinochet came to power, the Chileans who had studied at Chicago had really no influence in, in Chile. They were a very marginal group of academics. And for that reason, sometimes they took, they themselves, people who went on to become really infamous figures in Chile, when they were nobodies, they took teaching posts in other Latin American countries. And their largest deployment was actually to Colombia. So I traced them through Colombia. And what was interesting to me and really drove a lot of my research was that they did not have the careers there that you are just waiting for them to have. They do not do the work of neoliberal restructuring and they never do it at all. And what I find is that if you want to look for the roots of kind of neoliberal economic prescriptions in Latin America, they come from many other places. And I would sort of identify two key kind of sources. First are actually non-economists. 
Um, and the reason is this, economists are obsessively concerned with generating economic growth. And there are other groups that I found, especially like groups like architects and rural sociologists who are not oriented to that question. And they are the ones who will be, you know, happy to be told like, look, you, we, you have to build a lot of housing. We don't have any money for it. Figure out a way. The architect, that's his whole job. He's like, I can take your horrible, ridiculous budget and like, teach people to like go build it themselves with unpaid labor using like, you know, solidified, you know, like mixtures of soil and concrete. So a lot of the austere systems of social welfare provision that are getting like invented are actually not being invented by economists. The other thing that I um, found was that had made what they would of their education in the United States. They were not easily molded into the image of their U.S. professors. And that doesn't necessarily mean, again, that they were great figures of the resistance. It means that they were able to come up with neoliberal prescriptions all by themselves <laughs> using all sorts of found materials. And oftentimes what they're reasoning from is not like a single school of economic thought, but they're using uh, you know, they're using their training, but they're reasoning in terms of the forms of statecraft that they grow up knowing in the developmental state, which it turns out because it's generating so many weird practices can be like extrapolated and reasoned from to produce prescriptions for structural adjustment eventually. Great, if no one else would like to speak, we have a question from Quinn. Quinn, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for that. So I wanted to ask a little bit about ways that we can start thinking across the decolonization divide that, that Christy raised and sort of also in pursuit of linking it to the themes of the workshop. And one th question I had was sort of picking up from from Sam's point, which which Christy mentioned in the in the written version of this that that um, Moynihan seemed to be implying that part of what the NIEO was was a kind of exported British Fabianism. And I found that, I, I was sort of clutched onto that as a thread that's between the, the topics of the of the workshop. And I was wondering if you could say a bit more about that, whether or not Moynihan, because I haven't read his work, saw the NIEO as a kind of endogenous thing to the sort of tribalism of the global South, or if he saw it as, an export of European socialists, or if you saw it as a kind of toxic admixture of the two. And so, in other words, was beating the NIEO in opposition also a, an attack on European style socialism, or was it specifically an attack on post colonial versions of uh, redistributionism? And then, my second point was just kind of to pick up on something that Amy had mentioned about new work on the Caribbean. I really like the way that you dealt with that in the written version of this as well as like always being dealt with as this space of peculiarity or anomaly. And I think the work of people like Gary Wilder and um, Yaramar Bonilla has been very productive to think about the Caribbean as a space of also kind of non-sovereign futures, which are actually much more familiar to all of us than we probably sometimes would like to think. Because I think that if we're returning to the theme of the conference, the kind of end of the welfare state as a, a proud self-declared ideology in the 1970s in some ways, then the, the counter argument of, of neoliberalism is really that independence never happens, right? It's, it's to say that sovereignty is actually always partial and always a bit of a, a bit of a fib. And we need to sort of expose ourselves to the, the greater forces of the, the global market. And I think those countries that never did decolonized formally, the Arubas and the Martiniques, the Guadeloupes are actually very interesting um, to focus in on. So I completely agree with both with Amy and Christy that there's this problem of the decolonization divide. And I think it's helpful if we can find little hinges or places where we can see you know, parts of the European dynamic active in the Latin American Caribbean space and those, those overseas territories and so on that continue to persist are sort of obvious places, I think, to bring the two um, spaces of inquiry into conversation with each other. That's it. Thanks, Quinn. Maybe Christy, do you want to start us off? Uh, 
Um, sure. Um, so, yeah, I think that, you know, at least in in this one piece in the United States in opposition, um, Moynihan is very much making the argument that there has been a kind of direct transfer, right? That the NEIO comes directly out of the kind of export of European socialist ideals. And so I think the way that you put it there at the end, the idea that going after the NEIO is also going after European socialism um, is, is important. I mean, he says this interesting thing. He says um, that, and this is in the paper that I submitted, right? That the, the third worldism that has emerged is what he calls a Hegelian synthesis of kind of U.S. liberalism on the one hand and um, Soviet totalitarianism on the other hand, when you put those two together, what you get is this British Fabian socialist thing that has been exported via decolonization. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. there's all sorts of questions about how that might actually work, what the role of former French and German and Dutch colonies might be in that. Um, and then the obvious question of Latin America, right? Um, does he believe that the kind of mid-century socialism of uh, the Latin Americans is also transferable in this way, despite the fact that there is not this kind of direct and obvious relationship? So. It, it obviously it, it raises a lot of analytic questions, his, his analysis mm -hmm. in this way. Um, and for me particularly, because one of the things that I study is the kind of overlooked way in which the NIO is this kind of, is a project that harkens back to a deep um, internationalist project that Mexico has been pursuing over the previous five decades, right? There's a sense in which the Mexicans very much understand their vision for what they want the world order to look like as deriving from the experience of the Mexican revolution sort of projected outward, right? So they have a completely different narrative of how they come to mm -hmm. these very parallel ideas about mm -hmm. the countries of the third world as the workers um, needing to organize in a kind of trade union as, as Adam Gerichu has, has put it, right? Um, into a kind of trade union of the poor, of the global South. Um, and so, you know, the Mexicans sort of self-narrate coming to that idea based on the kind of particular exceptionalist Mexican history that they bring to the table. Um, so I think it's a it's a really interesting question. Moynihan's thinking is, um, it, at least in this one piece, uh, is not especially analytically tight on this question. Um, but I think that it is absolutely an idea as being sort of against European socialism and the European welfare state in that way. Although Moynihan himself at home has a kind of complicated relationship vis-a-vis -vis what he thinks the government should be able to do. Um, and particularly in the Negro family, he focuses on this idea of creating this jobs program. He says, basically, if we could just put black men to work, um, that would solve these problems. Um, and so I think it speaks to exactly the kind of austere... Um, social programming that Amy talks about in her book. I mean, one of the, he's not very clear in this in, in the Negro family either, but one of the ways that he hopes that we might put more um, black men back to work in the United States is recruiting them into the military, right? During the Vietnam War, sending them off to get killed overseas. Um, and so mm -hmm. um, those questions about um, what role the state should particularly play. Moynihan is a more complicated figure on this, and I'm sure Chelsea will speak to this as well. Um, mm -hmm. But the report itself, and because it becomes this kind of cause celeb when it comes out, gets taken up as this kind of uh, neoconservative flag and carried around. Um, and so uh, I think he has a bigger life, you know, his own ideas about this, they take on a bigger life in the neoconservative movement beyond him. It would be interesting to think about it as kind of a, a, a UK, US, um, dispute at the time, considering the yeah. labor government was in power and was right. seen as, you know, absolutely. going off the rails in a bunch of different ways. So it could be trying to attack them. Yeah, so. absolutely. Thanks. The only thing I'll add is just that at that point about sort of the Caribbean as a place to study non-sovereign futures is brilliant. And I hadn't thought of that, but I really like that idea. And I would be interested, Jess, I mean, as a Europeanist spending a year in Latin America, I, I would just be curious to know how that sort of came to be for you and what connections you're trying to draw. And given that we have, I, I see Adam Katachu is here and also Chelsea Shields, who I feel like are actually doing this kind of um, <laughs> uh, research at the intersection of the history of political economy in the Caribbean, which, I mean, I, I'm one of the culprits that wasn't smart enough to think of it. And so I would be interested in their insights. Um, I'll just add two things. Um, one, so um, I actually spent the first half of the year in Europe, but my spouse is a historian of Latin America, so we spent the second half of our of our sabbatical here. Um, since we had given up our apartment in the U.S., we didn't go back when the pandemic hit. Um, but I actually just wanted to echo um, 
Quinn's point about the remaining non-self-governing territories, I think that this is a really critical um, hinge, as you call it. I really like that term. Um, and for me, it's it's uh, a really powerful thing to think about, because if you think about the places um, that are the remaining non-self-governing territories, as considered by the UN, um, they're almost all places where the uh, primary export, as it were, is tourism. So uh, thanks for bringing that up. I think that's really important. Or tax haven, Ray. Fabulous. So we have only five minutes left, although I will tell you all that the lines are in fact open for another half an hour, but you don't. <laughs> uh, let's try to wrap it up within five to 10 minutes. Um, and then, you know, if you'd, if you'd like to keep chatting informally, that's fine. But we have um, Chelsea Shields and Charlie Mayer on stack. I would propose that we bundle their questions and then have all three panelists give us their last word and then we can you know have a little bit more of an informal back and forth so um chelsea why don't you go ahead first and then charlie you can jump right in after her thanks for such an amazing group of papers um i'm having quite a moment because i've never heard anybody mention aruba at a conference before i have <laughs> So that I've like waited my whole academic career for that. Thank you, Quinn. Um, my first question is for Christy. And as someone who's also interested in the, the global resonance of Moynihan, I was really edified by your paper. So um, I was curious about the note that you ended on about how this severe punitive backlash came after attempts to moderate more radical demands, not only in the civil rights movement, but also in international economic and development schemes. So I was wondering if you could say um, a bit more about those efforts and perhaps um, because Juliana raised the current political conjuncture that we are in right now, uh, what lessons we might draw from that today. Um, and Amy, thank you so much for your paper. You've really given us a powerful research agenda. And I love this idea of indirect connection. So this could be a really impossible methodological question, but I was wondering if you could uh, talk more about what finding those indirect connections looked like for you in a kind of practical uh, archival sense, because that's something that I've found quite challenging, especially as you point out when when people frame problems differently. So I'd love to hear how you how you navigated that. Thanks. Thanks, Chelsea. So, um, Charlie, you have the floor and then we'll hand it over to the panelists. Uh, am I, I guess I'm being heard. Thank you. This is, a, yeah. these are great papers. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm really indebted to them. Just a few points, which I think uh, really about continuities, perhaps from an, the earlier period. Uh, uh, first, on, uh, on Moynihan's notion of Fabianism. I mean, you know, the, the whole tradition of second international is second international socialism which Murdahl was connected with, uh, uh, and uh, and Brandt, of course, uh, I think uh, Moynihan was, he was very enclosed in an Anglo-American dialogue, and uh, Murdahl was already, uh, uh, had already provoked British anger when he was head of the European Economic Commission, uh, the Commission, the UN Commission for Economic Commission for Europe, because he had been much too friendly with the uh, with the, with the second world, that is, with the with the with the Soviet Union. So you might look look back on that. Uh, this is a lot of this is about rolling back the 1960s, the global 1960s. Uh, the tourism uh, paper. I'd really love to hear more, read more about that. Uh, it seems to me that tour, tourism as a project is so committed to a restorationist uh, perspective. Uh, uh, and the, this you might you might consider the, uh, the you know the the UN World Heritage sites in part of the in, as part of the tourist uh, project uh, when we went when I and my family went to uh, Mexico and Guatemala this is the 80s uh, you know the the vías arqueológicas were um, with an interesting uh, French uh, set of hotels that. Uh, I was in Mexico, and I remember being appalled in Guatemala by the Guatemalans having put together a, a an agency that dressed their tourists and their guides uh, as Incas uh, when we stayed in the market towns. They are uh, health continuities. I think uh, uh, consider the Rockefeller uh, Foundation uh, emphases in the in the interwar period on extermination of diseases. This certainly fits into the uh, malaria. Uh, 
uh, crusade afterward, the wiping, the, the big dispute there is whether you wipe out or you try and control, and it's being recapitulated today with discussions of, uh, uh, of, of COVID-19. And I'd like to ask, this may all come up in subsequent papers, I haven't taken account of the full program, but, uh, you know, the alternative perspective, the sort of modified uh, liberalism of Albert Hirschman, uh, there's a connection there through uh, Foxley in Chile and uh, no, uh, in Chile and uh, and also Colombia. Uh, I mean, it is just tremendous stuff here. And uh, I just would like, you know, widen it out when you look at these things. Uh, I think Christie's uh, discussion of Moynihan was wonderful, uh, these two papers, but uh, it's been great stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Charlie. Charlie. So... so Oops, Oops. Load, load, load. mic here. Um, I'd propose that we go in reverse channel order um, to close things out. So maybe Jess, you could get us started, then Amy, and then Christy. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm actually planning on having a, a, a whole chapter about um, the United Nations, both um, in terms of uh, the World Heritage Program, but also the UN. Um, did a lot of uh, investment through technical assistance in building tourism infrastructure in former colonies. Um, I I was actually supposed to be in New York this week at the UN archives, which didn't happen. Um, but it, it is a it is on the list for future archive trips. But um, I'm actually really fascinated, especially. Um, about world heritage sites that bridge the pre colonial uh, colonial and post colonial divide. So, for example, um, I was doing some research in Morocco earlier this year, and um, the city of Rabat, uh, the actual, the, the World Heritage Site explicitly encompasses the colonial city and the pre-colonial Medina. Um, and the, the language about, um, you know, Rabat as a World Heritage Site is about it being sort of at the crossroads of various empires. And so I'm interested in sort of how that resonates in the present today and how people are thinking about um, Morocco both as you know, it, its own thing, but also uh, the ongoing connection to the French. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for that comment. Um, I'll say just uh, that Hirschman is a really fascinating person, and I'd be happy to discuss him further. There's almost too much to say for this period of time, but he, um, you know, in his whole life was just orthogonal to everything, and he doesn't map easily onto any of the kind of um, kind of divides that we're discussing, and, and I, uh, I'm happy to talk for days and months with anybody who wants to discuss them with me. Um, uh, to Chelsea's question about how to find indirect connections, and I don't know if my experience um, is applicable, but for me, it kind of came from reading in archives, large archives that crossed a lot of categories in and of themselves. And for me, those kinds of archives weren't that hard to find because, for instance, like, U.S. businessmen and advisors or U.S. government agencies are themselves like just these insane repositories, like their papers. You find stuff on like education and also like a River Valley development program. And it's all like, you know, it's not in the same folder. But one of the things that just um, was difficult for me, but ended up being helpful for me in the end was that as I was reading, it was obvious that there were like things that were sort of all of a piece, but I couldn't find causal or like functional connections between them initially. I could just see that like the same person had himself been like at least reading about and like collecting material on these different things. And for me, it was a matter of like um, doing research in a very, very large number of archives that helped me get fill out a sense of who worked with who and the sort of sequence of events. And it also was a matter of reading in like pretty widely dispersed historiographies because like the kinds of education are amazing and I learned a ton from them. And it, I, a lot of what I was doing was trying to sort of substantiate connections between separate historiographies and between separate archives. And it, I don't know, it was just a lot of writing crazy drafts and workshopping them. <laughs> Um, well, thank you, and thank you to Charlie and to Chelsea for these questions and, and for this great conversation. This is kind of precisely what I hoped might happen here, so I'm really glad to be a part of this. Um, I would just say, uh, uh, to Charlie's point on, on Myrdal and thinking about, and you know, going back to British socialism, the labor government at the time, putting Myrdal in there, the relationship with the USSR, like, yes, this, that's perfect, 
um, I will definitely continue to consider those things. And, and you know, Myrdal appears um, as a kind of foil in, in a number of places here. So that's very useful. Um, on the question of sort of uh, one of the broader questions about sort of how we draw these connections and how we might begin to tell parallel histories and even if what, where we can't see them overlap, right, try and figure out how they might be influencing one another. One of the questions that's really animated um, how I have thought about this in the place of a country like Mexico vis-a-vis -vis the broader third world movement, the non-aligned movement, the G77, et cetera, um, has been to try to ask the question um, about economic sovereignty and what the actors in these places thought that that meant. Right. Um, it's clear that, you know, if you read Quinn's work, the, the idea that the neoliberals think that that's just like a preposterous question. And in some ways, we receive the notion that it is preposterous through our own kind of neoliberal filter, the memory that is precisely what Amy has talked about. Right. Um, and so, you know, in their in their kind of magisterial history of uh, these ideas of the U.N., um, Toy and Toy say that they, you know, basically when they look at the claims that are being made by third world actors, they, they have to sort of specify, like, look, these are these are reasonable things to say at the time that like there might be these kinds of colonial impulses. And um, so even our kind of received understanding of the idea that the countries in the third world might have particular conceptions of what it means to be economically sovereign and to uh, put put forward ideas about economic sovereignty that don't disavow interdependence or interconnection, um, but that still try to create space for these countries to sort of make their own decisions vis-a-vis -vis global capital and as we go forward in the 20th century, multinational corporations. I think that that's a productive question. What did the people in these places mean when they talked about economic sovereignty and how similar was that in places that had only recently decolonized and places that had decolonized 150 years before? Um, so that's a productive question for me when I'm trying to think about, you know, how weird is Mexico vis-a-vis -vis these third world conversations? Um, and then to Chelsea's question about the kind of the question of moderating, right? That's one of the things that I find the most interesting in looking through this um, is the, the historical sociologist Julian Goh has this idea about um, understanding the ways that hegemony is, is constituted through what he calls interactive multiplicity. That is, we have to understand not only how these things kind of move through time, but how they are iteratively um, shaping how these countries think about, how these actors think about things through time. And so what I what I see there is there is a sense in which the ideas that come forward from these countries in the third world and then the responses from, um, you know, these actors in the United States, we, we have to kind of trace this process of interaction as it goes forward through time. Um, and you see a number of people, the Mexicans in, in my case, it, during the new international economic order are absolutely trying to play this moderating role. They're specifically saying, you have the radical actors over here, you have the non-aligned, you have the Algerians, they're trying to do this thing. We are trying to conciliate, right? We're trying to meet the United States halfway, find a place where we might moderate some of these more radical impulses. And I think that there's obviously a similar dynamic at work within the civil rights movement where you have kind of more radical black nationalists, people who are arguing, you know, you can't move too fast. And the question of how you kind of conciliate that. The lesson for me is that no matter the impulse to moderate on the attempt of the kind of mediating force in the international sphere with the CERDs, Mexico, um, you know, within the civil rights movement, the, no matter the attempt to kind of mediate and meet power on its terms, right, there still emerges a kind of backlash. So there is still a backlash that kind of takes up um, the, a, a kind of crushing impulse toward any small move of progress, right? And I think that the politics that we're living through now is just indicative of the way in which that backlash has continued to snowball. And so to me, one of the questions then is um, about the about how smart the moderating impulse is to begin with, right? Um, obviously, it's something that we should study historically. We should try to understand those forces that attempted to moderate kind of more radical push from the left in order to, to sort of anchor it to the center. But if in every case, or if in the cases that we study, we see the kind of right backlash anyway, what are the moderators doing? That's, that's the big question for me when it comes to these things. Um, and so I think that that's interesting in the case of Moynihan, because you see with regard to the third world, with regard to the civil rights movement, you see 
people trying to say, like, if we could just sort of put this on the terrain of respectability politics, if we can put this in the place where the United States can come to under, or Kissinger can be okay with this, then we will make some progress. But what you get in response is just an insane right wing backlash. Right. So that that is a, a kind of important historical question to me, vis-a-vis -vis, um, the actors that show up as the moderating forces. Thanks. Thank you so much, Christy, and to everyone else. I would propose that we draw things to a close and um, and see one another again tomorrow. So if you could all join me, I'm not sure what the best way is to thank everyone. Maybe use the chat box. Um, and as I also noted in the chat box, feel free to use that chat box for additional comments, questions, ideas, et cetera, that you have. I would propose, I'll say this again tomorrow, but I would propose that we limit use of the chat box most of the session just because it can be a little bit distraction. Um, but once we get to kind of the last leg of the Q&A session, I am fine with opening that up as well so that we get as many voices as possible participating. That is clearly very, very important. Um, so thank you so much to the panelists and to the commentator. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Tomorrow's session is entitled Recasting the European Welfare State. Um, and we'll have Chelsea Shields, um, Laurent Rafluze, and Lauren Stokes joining us. So that promises to be really exciting. And I look forward to seeing you all again at the same time tomorrow. It looks like we do need an hour and a half. <laughs> um, but again, if you need to run off after an hour, we understand. You'll at least have a chance to listen to all of the papers. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. See you tomorrow.